Welcome back to yet another Explain Yourself interview here at the Entomological Society for America conference. I love you so much. Yeah. And this one is extra special for me. So this is Karen Poe. She is a postdoc at Penn State where I did my undergrad. Um, so I'm so excited to get a Penn Stater on here. This is going to be fun. So yes. thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here tonight. It's yeah. so exciting to be on this channel. It's awesome. Aww. I'm so excited. I've watched some of your videos and I'm like, oh, oh you're, you're so queen. sweet. <laughs> and then when I heard you were doing interviews, I was like, ah, I should know. You're so, so sweet. I'm yes. glad you volunteered. Yes. Um, oh. So <laughs> I am. To be your victim. Yes. To be your yes. victim. Yes. I'm always looking for more victims. <laughs> yes. Um, so the way we start this is for you to give us like the elevator pitch for your current research. Okay. Well, um, I mostly work on a, I actually work in a variety of different arthropods. So mm. my main project and why I was hired at Penn State was to work on tick chemical ecology. So figuring out what uh, attractants or even repellents um, are going to affect ticks, specifically Exodi scapularis, which are your black-legged ticks. And mm. as scientists, we're not very creative when we name things and they literally do have black black legs. So um, I mostly just kind of figure out what attracts them because there hasn't been too many studies understanding what attracts them. We mostly just, we figure that, you know, maybe these are random, but we are quickly finding out in the field that um, a lot of these ticks seem to find a, a white-footed mouse and they seem to attach to them more instead of um, other rodents that we find um, out in our field sites. Mm. So I'm trying to understand what are the host mediated and what are the even conspecific or basically ticks that are the same species as this one. Um, what semiochemicals or what smells basically do they emit that attract other ticks to it? Mm. So there are some studies out there suggesting that there are there are things that we admit that they are attracted to, but nothing has really been like set in stone. So that's what we're trying to figure out, trying to crack this code okay. of tick attractants. So that's one of my projects. So a second one um, is looking at fly parasitoids mm. and understanding uh, what kind of <laughs> what kind of poops they actually like. So I'm working with uh, bovine and poultry manure. Okay. And so fly parasitoids are parasitoids of fly pupae, which is like the uh, I don't know what you would call it exactly. It's like it's, it's not the sleeping case, bag. The sleeping bag of or flies. It's, it's like a like a a butterfly chrysalis but for a fly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's basically like a time of rest and a time of uh, maturation for the fly before they become an adult. So these parasitoids, they're actually aiming for that pupil stage. And so what they do is they actually inject basically their uh, their butts yep. <laughs> into into the fly pupa and then the parasitoid will grow inside it and basically kill it essentially and then eventually burst out and create new babies. So it's yeah. kind of fun. Um, so we're trying to figure out what kind of manures um, these parasitoids really like. What kind of sense those manures are emitting um, to attract either the parasitoids and or the flies. So are the parasitoids attracted to the poop necessarily or are they attracted only to the poop if there's um, pupae in there? So it's pupae and the poopy. That's what I like to call it. It's my that's adorable. Poopy and the poopy. I feel like you could make like There's bumper stickers or something. Oh yes. Oh yes. We have we have a lot of um, <laughs> autocorrects in our groupies and yeah. I laugh. And I, I, I would pull it out, but right now it's uh, it's lost in like all the messages that we have. Oh but it's, sure. <laughs> it's a fantastic conversation. I will one day read it or I post it on my Twitter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. But so there's a so there's a common theme between the two projects though. So you're interested in chemo sensing and arthropods. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that's like two of my biggest. Well, I guess um, the parasitoid one isn't one of my bigger ones, but um, those two do have a very common theme. It's yeah. chemical ecology and behavior of. Um, well, I guess one is of a vector. Another one is actually a biological control method. Mm -hmm. So we can use this to control fly populations, especially ones that we're thinking of. Um, that you can find on uh, cow or chicken farms. Yeah. So those are really huge problems yeah. um, on those types of farms. Um, but a third project that I'm working oh on. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a lot. As a postdoc, you work on a say, variety of different yeah. projects. <laughs> so it's all been really great and a lot of fun. I've been learning so much because previously I worked on mosquitoes. So mm. moving mm -hmm. to another vector, moving to biological control, um, it's been a really fun journey so far. But anyway, back to my third project. Um, so I actually have a community science project. Oh. Um, it's working with um, hunters. And we are looking at uh, deer heads and uh, ticks mm -hmm. found on deer. So hunter harvested deer. So yeah. actually, shameless plug. <laughs> uh -oh. But if anyone's a hunter out there and you're in the uh, mid-Atlantic, so states like Pennsylvania, New York, uh, New Jersey, Virginia, or West, not New Jersey, well, Maryland. Not New Jersey, Maryland, Maryland, Delaware, 
anywhere. Yeah. Um, if you are a hunter and you're going out deer hunting, we are taking participants still, um, and we will send you a kit full of uh, all the supplies to sample ticks and deer kits for us. Ooh. And we're trying to figure out the abundance of ticks and deer kits on the deer um, and throughout the United States. And we are going to be testing them for pathogens because uh, deer kits and ticks actually share the same host on the deer. So uh, we're thinking if uh, if the deer kids are on the deer when the ticks are, could they be picking up anything that the ticks might have from the mm, deer? Or, interesting. Or even co-feeding. There's this uh, yeah. phenomenon of co-feeding. Like if two ticks are two ticks are feeding on something and one's infected, some people say that the second one can actually get infected as well. Mm. At the same time, if they're immediately. Feeding them, wow. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That's. I, I mean, it's I knew terrifying. about like like temp, like time spaced out in reinfection, but mm -hmm. I didn't think about like. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Simultaneous. So, I don't know if it's actually like right away when they get infected. Um, there, I have to look more into that. But it, that's kind of something we're thinking about. But we're also thinking um, if they can pick up if the deer kids can pick up these pathogens. So mm -hmm. these are not normally considered vectors or insects that can actually transmit any diseases. They're mm -hmm. mostly nuisance pests. Their bites actually hurt quite a bit. <laughs> um, and they're quite nuisance pests, especially in high numbers. Mm. Um, we actually just uh, had someone submit some deer cats and she reported that she thought that there were flying ticks. Um, she was hunting deer and I think the deer cats then were like, oh, there's someone breathing here. Let's attack the humans oh, no. instead of the deer. So yeah, so <gasps> she got some deer cats from them. But, but anyway, so um, if you're a hunter out there and you're interested, we'll send you a kit full of uh, collecting supplies and we'll send you instructions and a data sheet, it's all for free. Um, we send it to you and then you send it back to us. Post is just paid for. Uh, we would love to see what deer cats and ticks you have in your area. And you get to do science and like you get to do science. put dead bugs in vials yes. and ooh. Yeah. Yeah, this That's community fun. science at its best. So what's great about the project is that the hunters have been so helpful in this. They're always so excited yeah. to help with science. They love it. They're like, where are there our updates? And I'm like, we're getting there. I promise we're getting there. <laughs> uh, but we still have a few kits left, so feel free to sign up at paparasitehunters.com. Nice. So I promise I didn't come up on here just to oh no mention that. but that's well, cool i yes. love i love 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 community science and yes. the fact that you've got a, a project like that is really yes exciting. so i actually presented on it yesterday nice. um, but we have we actually have 70 kits back already out of 1200 that we're aiming to reach wow. so 70 hunters already sent back their kits and we got about 400 specimens already 400 Oh, I guess 200 ticks and 200 kits so far. So that's amazing. That's actually a lot more than we got last year from our just from our community science. Very nice. Uh, from last year. So, nice. yeah. So it's really exciting, and it's really I'm so excited for this project. And it's actually part of this project. I developed a workshop through um, our extension team. Oh. And so a lot of um, extension educators, which is basically like agents. Yep. They have different names. Yep. Um, but the educators pretty much were telling us, uh, well, we get a lot of questions about vectors and vector-borne diseases, but we don't have the entomological background or the mm -hmm. vector biology background to answer these questions. So we're like, hey, we can probably develop a workshop um, to help fill this gap for them. Nice. So um, I helped develop a workshop and we had a lot of different topics represented. So things like vector biology, vector-borne diseases, how to protect yourself and your animals from, from getting these vector bites and integrated vector management, which is basically just using different methods of um, management to control vector populations, whether it's the vector itself or the host mm -hmm. itself. Um, so we had different topics and then um, yeah, it's, it was a great time. And having to evaluate it was also a lot of fun too. I realized I really like evaluating programs, um, programs yeah. which is a lot of fun to me. I don't yeah. know why. And when we give them, we gave them a pre-workshop quiz actually. And um, so this was a quiz we give at the beginning of the workshop before we teach them anything, just to kind of gauge a baseline of what the uh, participants' knowledge is at the moment. Sure. And so I think the average score is about 55%. So not bad, <laughs> but also not too great. Right. So at the end of the workshop, we gave the exact same quiz to them and the scores went about 43 percent wow yeah so the average score jumped up to about 70 percent and a lot of people got perfect scores that's awesome so, yeah so we were really excited to see this result it's like it tells us that we are doing a good job they are retaining information it gives us an idea of what we can improve on for next year and mm -hmm. hopefully make this workshop public 
for Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, and probably make it more specific for hunters even. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's, that's amazing. And that, yeah. that workshop is exactly the sort of resource that a land grant university like Penn State is supposed to be providing through exactly. the extension program. So exactly. it's amazing that they could coordinate with researchers at the university to really enhance what the extension can provide. Exactly. So extension has been incredibly helpful with this. They were very supportive of this workshop and the educators themselves, they provide us some very honest feedback. <laughs> Most, it, no, when I say honest, I mean they were very positive about it. Oh, good. And so um, they gave us any critiques that we had and I and I greatly appreciated that. Mm -hmm. They're like, if they if the educators can understand it, how can you expect the rest of the population to understand it? Right. You know? So it's it was a fun time and I really enjoyed working with um, Extension and the educators and all the other participants that were in our workshop that day. Awesome. So yeah, it was an eight-hour workshop by the way. I should probably Ooh, mention that. So that's the fact a that their scores workshop. went up yeah. after eight hours is impressive by yeah. itself. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I have to thank all my collaborators for it and all the people who spoke at this workshop. It was, it could not have been done without their help. And community science in general cannot be done without you guys no. out there. No, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to admit a moment of ignorance. I don't know, I don't know that I've ever heard of a deer kid. A deer, deer kid, yes. So, yeah. Can you describe that? Yeah, That's, so I'm deer kids are that. not... Um, they are not deer on like your kids, like your shoes. Um, they're actually mistaken quite a bit for for ticks. Okay. So deer kids are in the family Hippoboscidae. They're actually a fly. Oh. They are a true fly. So okay. things like house flies or stable flies, mm -hmm. basically things that get in your face and kind of annoy you. Yeah, they're actually a true fly. So what's interesting about Hippoboscidae, and depending on the species, their life cycle can differ a little bit. Um, deer kids will. They will have wings as adults, okay. but once they find their host, and for deer kids, it's usually um, cervids, so deer, for example. Or moose or elk. Um, exactly, yeah. so once they find their ideal host, which is a cervid, um, they will actually shed their wings. Oh. They shed their wings, and so, uh. what, so if you find one on a deer, you can actually almost assume that that was their host. That was their only host <coughs> that they've been feeding on, but sure. pretty much their, well, it's their adult stage. Nice. So yeah, so they shed their wings, and they're pretty much stuck on there. and. What's interesting is um, last year, one of my collaborators noted that um, the hunters, sometimes they wouldn't turn in their deer right away. Sometimes mm -hmm. it would be like a day or two and oh my God, it smells awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they would, they would still find deer kids. Still really? Still walking around. They're, oh. I guess they just throw the deer in like a freezer or a fridge. So it kind of slows the deer kids down, but probably not necessarily kill them. Right. So they still found the kids on the deer. So they didn't move much probably because they were cold. Um, but yeah, they are stuck on there for life. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I yeah I'd never heard of that before. Even though my my dad was a hunter yeah. and everything, but yeah, that's yeah. that's fun. I think if you look at if you look up deer ked, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to look up the specific species, it's Lepoptena cervi. Lepoptena is such a cute name. Yeah, it's such a cute. It does sound so, cute. <laughs> yeah, so if you look that up, you you can actually once you see it, you're like, oh yes, that's that looks like a fly because mm. it has the very mm -hmm. like very big eyes, yeah. has the wings. The legs are probably the weirdest part because I feel like they stick out a little bit more than a fly's. Oh. Um, they're a little bit thicker, I feel, but Is yeah. that maybe, so I'm, I'm thinking that the, the wing shedding thing is part of that whole being a good ectoparasite, right? Where you want to have, uh, like that's why ticks are so flat, right? You want to have that nice smooth back so that it's hard flat. to scratch you off. Exactly. Do you think that the thick legs make them better at holding on? Probably, um, so they might have also like specific fingers, mm. kind of like legs, they have, yeah. I don't think they necessarily have have claws, but maybe they have certain um, widths uh, of their grabby finger thingies. <laughs> They're tarsy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little late now. Yeah. Grabby finger thingies. That's actually a new one. Yeah. Um, no, so, I yeah, love they, it. they might. I mean, we haven't looked at that yet. So, I think morphology, it's a very understudied <coughs> species. Yeah. Uh, actually, family in general. They're very understudied. No one's really looked at them. So, we're trying to figure out their geographic range and if they occupy the same host. Well, mm -hmm. they obviously, they occupy the same host at this tech. We actually find them together. But do they occupy the same region of a host? Sure. So, if you find ticks on the head, would you find a deer kid there? Or would a deer kid be more near the rump or on their belly or on their legs? So, that's. But that's what we're trying to figure out. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I feel like I could spend three more hours asking you questions just about all of these postdoc projects. Um, yeah, you, uh, well, that conversation cool. might be short. You can keep asking questions. I'm like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, I I know yeah. someone else who researched. Um, so when you were talking about fly parasitoids, you mean parasitoid wasps? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. They're actually they're terrible flyers. These parasitoid wasps that we're working with. So I think in our lab we're working with um, Spalangia okay. and Muscatifurex. So, uh, yeah, they're terrible flyers. I don't yeah. know if that's true for all parasitoids. I don't think that's true for all parasitoids. They look like they kind of jump better than, mm. than fly. So I'm like, are you sure you're a hymenopteran? 
That kind of makes sense, though, considering the environment that they're moving in. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm wondering how they even find their hosts. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're thinking it's like, do they find their hosts just by going through brain of poop barriers? But if they don't fly very well, or they don't transport very well, there has to be another mechanism or another reason mm. why or how they find their they find their hosts. Yeah. Yeah. So So because those wasps are employed as a biocontrol, like they are actually like I mean they exist wild in wild populations, but then people also breed them and release like large numbers of them on farms to try mm -hmm. to keep down the flies. Yeah. So are you interested in wild populations of the parasitoid wasps or the released like colony bred ones that are sold as biocontrol? Oh, so I actually haven't gotten that far. We're still oh. doing our, our, um, our bioassays currently. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so um, at some point it would be nice to, to look at uh, wild populations and see how they react to, to these different manures mm -hmm. because when, right now, we are mostly working with colony, colony okay. bred parasitoids. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be so bad to release laboratory ones, but of course, with the difference between laboratory and field um, insects or arthropods in general, it's like they do have different behaviors. Right. Because especially with all the inbreeding, um, at some point, genetic, I don't know, it's genetic drift probably happens. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, where like their behaviors start getting different. I know with mosquitoes, um, I know. Uh, there's one colony that I remember working with, and it was so, they're so different from, from field ones. Because when you collect mosquitoes from the field, they don't readily fee feed on an artificial blood source. Sure, yeah. So with our lab ones, they're like, oh yeah, give me that, give me that shot of blood, please, now. Give me that artificial blood. Oh my gosh. But, but the field mosquitoes, they know, they're like, no, you got to give me like the top shelf stuff. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's really, it's really interesting to see how the genetics actually change with, um, with lab versus field insects. Yeah. So but I guess be, that's part of the reason I asked because yeah. I wasn't sure. Yeah. yeah. So just because you release, um, lab reared insects, so, I mean, it doesn't, it, it isn't going to work, but you do have to consider that they were raised in a different environment from, yeah. from the wild ones. Absolutely. So, yeah. That is a really good question though. <laughs> Um, and another thing that you sort of mentioned, um, so in your the first project you mentioned you were talking about ticks and white-footed mice, mm -hmm. and then in your third project you were talking about ticks on deer, mm -hmm. and we also know that ticks can wind up on us, unfortunately. Boy, I hate them. And your um, dogs. And your dogs. And cats, and but cats. keep your cats indoors. That. <laughs> Absolutely that. Yes. Um, so yeah, can you sort of talk us through like how a tick does tick things, and like why it has all of those different hosts, or you know how, because you I, talked about vectoring. Yeah. And um, I, there's a lot of research out there, and everyone has their own theories, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Okay, okay that's fair. <laughs> but I can tell you how they can find a host, though. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're walking down a trail, and ticks like ticks can sense that they they love the smell of anything that pretty much walks and breathes, and yeah. looks like warm-bodied, or do they also do cold-bodied or? Cold bodied, you know, reptiles and things. I think that'll depend on your species. There are mm. some that are like more specific towards like reptiles or oh, amphibians. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, nice. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but when they feel you like walking, they can actually feel you walking on like a trail. They can mm. feel like vibrations, they can smell you, they can sometimes sense heat. So sure. they have what's called a hauler's organ and it's actually located at the tip of their two front legs. So um, what they do is they go through questing. So let's say they get like a quick whiff of you. They're like, oh, what is that? I need to smell it better. So you know what they do? They quest, so they lift their arms. So quest with me, we're questing. I requesting. did hear this, that they requesting. sort of like wave their arms back and forth, right? Yeah. That's why they have so many extra legs so they can hold onto the exactly. grass and yeah, okay. Exactly. So they'll get this whiff of you, they lift their legs up in order to smell you a little bit better. That sounds really wrong. <laughs> I realize that. But they, they want to smell you a little bit better. It's, yeah. a, it's a great way to do that. Um, but it's also a passive way for them to attach to you. So as you walk mm. by, they can actually use those front legs Yoink. and attach onto you, to, onto your skin, Clever. onto your hair and your legs. Or your clothes. Or your clothes. Yeah. Or your dog's hair. Or mm -hmm. Pretty much anything. So yeah, it's a very passive way to get on them. Nice. Yeah. And then I know they don't usually just stay where they grabbed, right? right? Yeah. They So ticks love humidity. They love the humidity. That's mm -hmm. actually what keeps them alive. So during the winter, they will actually burrow into the leaf litter. So mm -hmm. if you have a lot of leaves in your yard, you kind of just let it sit there for a while. And as the ground starts to freeze, it will actually burrow into a leaf litter. That keeps them, that actually keeps them from freezing. That's part of the reason we like colder winters, right? Is because it kills more of them. Well, there's some misconceptions about really? that. Really? Yeah. So um, they can stay alive under that leaf litter. That actually keeps them alive. And they can oh. almost go dormant, if you will, um, during that 
uh, cold period. And once hmm. the temperature starts rising again, um, they'll be like, ah. It's time to rise up, friends. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, yeah, no. So, so, no. <laughs> so during the winter, actually, it's a time of uh, development as well. So they'll actually molt. So after, so for most ticks, the ones that we're thinking about, like these hard ticks, um, especially Zoe scapularis, which is a three-host tick, okay. they have a two-year life cycle. Oh. So, yeah, I don't want to go through the life cycle right now. It's really confusing. <laughs> and I remember looking at this graph. So many life cycle diagrams are yes. super confusing. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so... After they feed on a host, they'll drop off their host. Sure. They'll try and find somewhere to hide as they start to develop. They'll molt or evolve into their next level, mm -hmm. not next level, next well, stage. Like a Pokemon. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking yep. of. <laughs> um, so they'll evolve to their next stage. And um, if it's during the winter, they'll usually just stay under there mm. due to environmental cues. And then once it's like warmer, they'll be like, aha, it's time to go back up and find my next meal. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So oh. I forgot. I even forgot what your. I was just sort of asking about, yeah, like, you know, how how do they find hosts? Why so many different hosts? That mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I have no idea why. They do have a pretty wide host range. I think mm -hmm. they do have certain preferences. Mm. And why they do is something we're trying to figure out. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. So, Very cool. Yeah. So the thing with, like, the mice. Um, so one of the other grad students is actually looking at um, whether these ticks actually prefer um, certain small mammals because during a certain period of the tick's life, which is the larval stage and sometimes the nymphal stage, it's really just the younger stages yeah. of the tick, um, they do prefer smaller mammals and they're wondering, hmm. and we're wondering like, why do we see so many of ticks on this species versus another species? And we're not sure if it's like the landscape or if it's um, host mediated even, like is it something that these mice or these other small mammals are emitting that attracts them? We're oh. not really sure. So um, part of my project, uh, we'll be working with, with, that, with that grad student to get that Very done. cool. Yeah, so she's doing a lot of really cool work. So nice. I should probably like forward my stuff, or forward <laughs> her stuff to you because I think <laughs> her stuff is so cool. That would be neat. Yes, yeah. it would be, yeah. Yes. Um, and that's actually kind of a good segue into one of the other things that we like to talk about on mm -hmm. here. So grad student or mm -hmm. the grad student experience Experience. So you're a postdoc, which means that you did all of the grad school things. Yep. And you are now postdoctoral. Yeah. We call you doctor and all of that That's good weird. stuff. I, it is weird. I don't know if I like that. I. You should because I you know. put so much hard work into it. No, I get emails off that say doctor, but I'm just like, please. <laughs> please don't. Please call me Karen. <laughs> well, but what I want to know is, how did you get there? Right. How did so I get we're there? taking it back. Yeah. How, why did you decide to go to college to become a scientist? Mm -hmm. And why did you decide to go a to school more after a bachelor's degree and yeah. wind up with your PhD? Yeah. yeah, so it's a really interesting way. Like I always knew I wanted to go into science and like every, pretty much every college student, I was probably, I was definitely a pre-med. Oh. And then I realized, I was like, this is, I don't think this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember my first two years, I was a human biology major and it was great, but I was like, this isn't what I'm looking for. So I went to school at UT Austin, hmm. um, and they had just started offering a BS in public health. Oh. I was their first cohort. We were the guinea pig, pretty much. So I was in my, I guess, second year. I was like, I want to do the public health degree. That sounds so cool. I never, I honestly had never heard of public health, but then I think there was a public health fair, and that's when I knew more about it. I'm like, actually, that's what I want to do. Nice. I, pretty quickly found out that it's exactly what I wanted to do. And so I had two years, my last two years of my, of my bachelor's, um, I took a bunch of public health classes. And then I was like, that's it. That's it. I want to do more. <laughs> so, yeah, so then I decided to apply for an MPH program. Okay. And I did my two years as a master's student in the public health program. And it was environmental occupational health sciences. Mm. And so um, I went that route. I, sh I thought about that or epidemiology. Um, but I went the environmental route because there was a professor there who was working uh, with vector-borne diseases. At the time, at the time, as a wee, wee undergrad and a wee <laughs> master's student, <laughs> I did not realize that I had a very specific interest in vector-borne diseases. I was mm. always, I was always interested in infectious diseases and microbiology, but I didn't necessarily know about vector-borne diseases. Oh. And so, in my master's, I actually had. Um, I guess you could call her a mentor. Yeah. And she was fantastic. She was a fantastic professor. <laughs> and I uh, I wish everyone could have a mentor like her. Uh, but she approached me one day. She's like, you know, you do a lot of really good work. You really should think about a PhD program. Mm. So she inspired me to actually apply for a PhD program. And I told her, I was like, you know, I'm really interested in vector-borne diseases. She's like, well, I might know someone at Texas A&M. Um, 
because she went to vet school there. She's like, I might know some people who might know some people there. Right. <laughs> so that's actually how I got in contact with my with my PhD advisor. Mm. So that's so that's kind of how I got roped into entomology because he was in the Department of Entomology <laughs> sure. and he had a project available at the time. It was very serendipitous. I don't know. I honestly, it was such a serendipitous moment. I didn't think that something like this could happen. <laughs> in all honesty. <laughs> um, so I would think. I kind of think it was. It's a kind of a rare occurrence for this to happen. So, um, so yeah, that happened, and then I did my PhD things. It was very difficult. We can talk about that next if you want. <laughs> um, and when I met my postdoc advisor, um, I actually got it from an advisor email. So we mm. have like grad school advisors. Um, so they send out like blasts of like people are looking for this student or mm -hmm. this postdoc. Or, Here's a job. Here's a faculty position or whatever. I'm like, why are you sending it to PhD students? <laughs> faculty positions. But anyway, um, so I remember seeing this job ad, and her her job description was almost exactly what I was really interested in. Well, hey. Exactly. So she had a project with um, with mosquitoes and birds at one point, mm. um, but I got switched to ticks pretty quickly after that because yeah. I was like, I'm actually really interested in ticks as well. So, um, cause I wanted to kind of expand my portfolio a little Absolutely. bit. So I was like, you know what, this sounds, this sounds awesome. So mm -hmm. I actually met her at, at uh, ESA in Denver. My first, first year I met her there. Conferences are a good place to make yes. those kind of connections. Yes. So actually it was really funny because I remember emailing her and she's like, oh, well I actually need someone to start in April. And I was like, oh no, I am not going to be done until like next fall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I met with her, um, because I knew that she was going because I actually talked to a friend of hers <laughs> that I knew that I knew was friends with her. I was like, hey, do you know if she's going? She goes, yes, she is. You should definitely like talk to her. Nice. So I talked to her at ESA and we got together and she was awesome. And I guess that was my interview. I didn't realize it at the time. Um, but yeah, so I then quickly had to finish up my PhD. I met with her again after I defended um, at ESA last year in Vancouver mm -hmm. just to make sure everything was good. And it was, and then I moved up in November and started in January. Cool. Yeah. Nice. It's a, it's a long journey. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that, but yeah, it's a <laughs> long, fun journey. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you talked about several sort of mentors or advisors or supervisors. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more? You said it's a little serendipitous how you got connected to them, but you might have gotten connected to them, but you decided that they were people you wanted to work with. So like yeah. what sorts of things are important in a good mentor for you? Or like, how do you go about shopping for a good mentor? Someone who's very supportive. And it was, um, I actually visited, for my PhD, um, I visited a &M before making my decisions, before they had their, like, um, what is it, their uh, visiting student, prospective student tours sure, or whatever. Yeah. They're called, I think they're called prospective student tours. <laughs> so I visited uh, before that, and they let me, you know, I met with, with my advisor, I met with his lab. Mm. Um, I actually met with his wife's lab as well. Cool. So she has a lab, and we became, like, sister sibling labs. It was kind of very, we became very big at one point, and we are like, okay, we got to stop this. We have our own, like, labs. <laughs> and it's, it was so much fun, though, like, having both of the labs there. They're so amazing. Yeah. They're such amazing people. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I got to talk to them, and at one point, um, he left He left me with the grad students, and he was like, yeah, they can talk honestly about me. Mm -hmm. and I, so I asked them, I was like, is he supportive? Like, what is his... Um, what does he expect out of me? What do we expect out of you? Yeah. Um, how is his dynamic with you and the rest of the lab and the rest of the faculty even? Um, they're all very, they're all very positive about their interactions with him. So I think um, one of the greatest things though was saying that he is very supportive of different projects and um, of any any routes you want to take. So. Yeah, so even to this day, I still talk to him. Well, I've only been a postdoc for a year, so of course I should be still. I should still talk to him. He's great. I would never not <laughs> talk to him. Um, but he, yeah. So it's being supportive of the endeavors that you want to do. And I think he asked me what I wanted to do, and um, you know, I kind of got this idea of maybe working with government officials because I, at that point, I think I wanted. Like I knew what my project was going to be. It was just like West Nile virus in Texas, mm. working with um, local Texas um, mosquito control programs and looking at their data and using their data, incorporating it into like a model to predict um, West Nile virus transmission dynamics and nice. stuff like that. So um, very valuable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so he was like, you know, I think this would be a really good fit for you because that will get you some experience with vector control. Um, 
and working with uh, vector control communities to see what it's like and if it's really something you want to do. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely something I'm still thinking about as nice. well as like as I finish a postdoc, which I don't know how soon that's going to be, but as I start looking for um, my next chapter, it's mm -hmm. kind of like. I, I am leaning more towards government, but there are academic positions, and there's also industries. There's so many options out there. Yeah, especially so, with the sort of, the stuff you've been working on. Yeah, yeah, with vector biology has been getting a lot of news lately. So it was mosquitoes for a while, mm -hmm. and now it's ticks, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm kind of following the certain trends. So maybe I should start another trend. Maybe we'll do deer kids next. Ah. Ah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. yeah. And he's he is very supportive. He's like, you know, if you ever need help with anything, please don't be afraid to call. That's awesome. Like that. so. That's the best kind of advice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he is one of those people who's like, get it done as soon as you can, but also take care of yourself <laughs> as well. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Those are the stories I like to hear. Yes. Um, I do want to ask you though, mm -hmm. why disease vectors? You said you, you know, knew you wanted to do that. They are just so fascinating to me. I remember <laughs> there was a class that I had to take for my public health degree is one of the last classes I took mm -hmm. um, and I honestly I think it was emerging infectious diseases okay and I think it was the instructor <clears throat> at that time mm. that taught it she was amazing and she explained everything so well and it made me it just engaged me so well and I was like first of all I want to be like her one day second of all I want to study this I this is so cool but she was studying um, mostly uh, zoonotic diseases so okay. not necessarily vector-borne diseases yeah. um, so she was studying things like influenza, um, hepatitis, herpes maybe? She studied a lot of things, nice. a lot of different viruses. And a zoonotic disease is a disease we can get from other animals. Exactly. That doesn't necessarily yes, have to be, no, it's all right, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be vectored through something like a mosquito or a tick that's right. like taking blood and exactly. blood-borne things from one yeah. animal to another. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of vector-borne diseases actually do, ha are actually zoonotic diseases. Right, yeah. Well. So it, it gets kind of confusing. I'm like, wait, is it? So all vector-borne diseases, not all vector-borne diseases are zoonotic. Right, but. <laughs> but not all zoonotic. And all, not all zoonotic diseases are vector-borne. Right, yeah. It's very, yes. Yeah. Very yeah. complicated. It is, it is. And so, oh my goodness. But yeah, at, I think it was like during that class, like I kind of had an inkling when I was taking a microbiology class. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> but I didn't necessarily think I would go into it at that point. But okay. it was that class I think was kind of the turning point for me when I kind of knew that I wanted to study some type of zoonotic disease. And then in my MPH with my mentor, um, she, she was like, you know, vector borne diseases. We talked about it for like one class for one of our classes. And it was mostly zoonotic diseases classes too, actually, ironically. <laughs> but it was during that one class where I'm like, those are so cool. Mosquitoes and ticks, so cool. They really Flies, are. awesome. So that's, and there was a lot of turning points. It was like a little bit at a time. It's like a cranking motion in a way. It's like a little bit, a little bit, and then whoo. <laughs> That's kind of how it was for me. Yeah, I especially like that you said like, oh, the whole reason you went into the public health program is because you sort of found it. And, and same thing that you sort of found vector-borne disease. Like, I think that's- I find things a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, but that's, I don't think that's an atypical experience either yeah. that a lot of us sort of just like fall into stuff or how you got introduced to people. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I appreciate that you shared those sort of like, oh, well, like I didn't know where my trajectory was going and then it went this way and yeah, then it went this way. And exactly. like, it's totally okay if it doesn't follow like no. the ideal there's no linear Picture, track for yeah. science. <laughs> and if you have one, that is awesome. Like, oh my gosh, like kudos to you yeah. for getting that like done right away. I just, I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But it worked. And it worked. <laughs> and I'm very happy with where I am now. I don't regret my decisions one bit. That's amazing. At all. That's amazing. And it, it's been a wild ride. And meeting the people along the way, also like probably the best part. Oh, Cause you gotta yeah. have a support system when you're in grad school. Whether it's your family, whether it's friends that you make or, it should be all of the it above. It should be all of the above, yeah. <laughs> or the animals you meet. Yeah. Or the animals that you have. Yeah. <laughs> Me, I meet dead deer, does that count? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Technically the insects and arthropods are animals too. They so. are, you're right, they yeah. are, yeah. <laughs> I actually go by the insect zoo at Penn State. Do you? Yeah, and I'm like, oh, they're so cute. All the little roaches, and I'm like, usually I'm like, mm, roaches, but they're just the hissing cockroaches. I well, just, hissing cockroaches are like a whole different they thing are. than other cockroaches. I know, that's true. I do they're love so them. They're so cute, though. They really are. Um, a and also had some, and they, they, if you poke them enough, they'd be like, Shh. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so <laughs> if you do that enough, I used to work with some for like program animals. Oh, if you really? do if you do that enough, they stop hissing. They get habituated they to do. human contact they and then they just like eh. Mm. Even within like a few minutes, I'm mm -hmm. like, Why aren't you working? Work. <laughs> so I'm like, 
oh, hey, kids, you want to see a trick? And then I poke him, and they're like, no. It didn't do anything, yeah. And you're like, mm, they just pooped on you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah so, but outreach has also been, like, a huge component um, Yay. of my life as well. So I think being able to co- incorporate that more during my postdoc position. Um, so my advisor actually has my postdoc advisor. She has a an extension appointment. Awesome. Um, and so... I help her out sometimes by giving talks or uh, like on her behalf mm-hmm. or doing some outreach programs and it's been a lot of fun interacting with the communities um, so and I've always been volunteering for different organizations um, and college well in high school even high school college and my MPH program I was always like trying to volunteer for a bunch of things and that kind of got me sidetracked sometimes but it was a lot of fun it's and fun I don't regret it and it's valuable <laughs> it is yay and you get to show kids like hey cockroaches aren't so bad don't touch that tarantula though don't touch that centipede you don't want to touch the tarantula because they're so fragile (laughs) i think think a kid actually broke a tarantula once i know and then we're like oh we're not allowed to use that anymore yeah (laughs) no i don't want to touch centipedes either no i actually had a kid so the centipede was like sealed it Uh was sealed into like this plastic little to go container with like holes at the top to let it breathe yeah this kid was very determined to open this container I'm pretty sure he was about to succeed until I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> don't do that. But that will hurt. I know. Oh. I'm like, I don't know how to help you if you get bitten. Yeah. yeah. No fun. No fun. No. No. So <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that, that was, that's been my, I don't know how many years it's been. I graduated from college in 2012. I went to college. I started college in 2008, graduated in 2012. So I guess it's been over, it's definitely been over 10 years since I started college and it's almost been 10 years since I graduated college yeah. and seeing, and I don't know if a decade ago me would have pictured me being here, to be honest, <laughs> especially an entomology program sure. because I'm not an entomologist by trade. I'm a public health, I have a public health background and I got, you know, trained in entomology after that. And usually I actually find people go into public health after entomology. Mm. So I actually have a really good friend. Um, she... She was an entomology like double major, and then she went to public health. Interesting. So yeah, so it can go like both ways, I guess. Yeah, you know. Well, they they interact with one another so much they as are. you described. Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, ticks and mosquitoes are very much public health. Um, I don't want to call them pests. Public health problems. They're yeah. problems. <laughs> public health problems for for a lot of people and a lot of animals as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm mm-hmm. really glad I I'm really glad I chose this this route to go into entomology Aww. because like then you get to meet cool like insect people like you. Uh, and you get to go to cool conferences like mm-hmm. ESA. It's mm-hmm. one of, it still overwhelms me every year how much there is. Yeah. And it's amazing, like the best way. Yeah. So and you get to see like the same people over and over again. You're like, oh, I know you. Let's connect. <laughs> It's nice to so, make friends and like find is. people that you enjoy talking to exactly. about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then you see them on Twitter. <laughs> and there was actually a Twitter post saying, like, they're like, I know you from Twitter. I'm like, oh, that's like the greatest form of flattery mm-hmm. now. I actually, I do say that now. I'm like, I follow you on Twitter. That's okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a way we meet people and <laughs> exactly. form valuable connections since we're so spread out across the country or the world. True. So. Yeah. People tell me to identify something. I'm like, oh, yeah. I know just I enough about of... insects to be dangerous. Oh, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I know not to touch a centipede. Sure. Yeah. That's important. I know that. If you're on Fear Factor, oh. never cuddle with a centipede. No. Go for the millipedes. <laughs> yeah, millipedes are adorable. They're so cute. When you see them like running across the floors with all their little legs, they can't go very fast because they have so many little legs. Yeah, and oh. they they just eat like leaf litter, so they're they super harmless. And, yeah, yeah. Those, some of them are a little stinky, but you know. Yeah, they kind of glide as well. It's very graceful. Yeah, and they're so round. I love round animals. <laughs> one of our study, one of our study interests, I guess, one of our study animals of interest mm-hmm. is a red bat a red-backed bull. They're one of the roundest. Such cute little mammals. Oh, they're so round. Oh, no. Every time like, I open a trap and there's a vole and it's just sleeping in its nest, I'm like, you're so cute. They really are, though. I'm, I'm so sorry I have to do this right now. There's we don't kill them. We process oh. them, like weigh them and stuff. So yeah. They get released. <laughs> yeah, no, small mammal trapping is cool. They're so chonky. They are. Oh, my gosh. They're thick chonks. Yeah. I will tell you that much. The only yeah. not fun thing about small mammal trapping is you have to do it super early in the morning. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I I did, like, a side project with birds for a little bit. Mm. And you had to wake up very early for that as well. Yeah. That's yep. probably, like, the hardest part of doing any, like, mammal work or any animal work not just mammals but a lot of them are nocturnal yep (laughs) and some of them have field seasons all year round so Uh another student in my in my lab she she had she wears some black bears and they are active 
or she has to check on them like pretty much year round. Yeah. So yeah, yeah she That's her super project awesome. is really cool too. So Very we cool. work with a variety of different animals in our lab. Being a veterinary yeah. entomology lab, it kind of makes sense that we work with different different yeah. animals, even though the animals that I technically work with are dead. I mean, no. yeah, it's an animal. Yep. It was an animal, still is. Yep. Even that if works. it's alive or dead. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I sort of mentioned to this to you before we started rolling the camera, but um, the other purpose for these interviews is to talk about the fact that um, anyone who wants to or is interested mm -hmm. in it can and should become a scientist. And um, so I guess the next question is, um, so if there are certain, uh, I guess I sort of call them like diversity categories or like diversity checkboxes if you were yeah. filling out the census, um, diversity categories that you identify with, um, how have those sh sort of uh, shaped or, um, you know, affected your experience as, uh, you know, and your, your experience through being a scientist? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to answer that question to be honest. Yeah? I, yeah. I'm trying to think about it. I'm like, I don't think I was treated any different. That's okay. <laughs> well, well, actually, I guess as a female in entomology and yeah. being a kind of male-dominated field in, in our department at a it was pretty male-dominated. Really? Yeah, so we're, we are getting more female entomologists um, as faculty in the department, so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, you can start to notice certain patterns and like people who get recognized on the wall for like awards or um, fellowships. Award walls. Oh my yeah, I goodness. Just go, Ooh, I don't look like any of them. Mm -hmm. Whether it's like being Asian, like an Asian American or um, being a woman, it's I'm like that none of those people look like me. Yeah, <laughs> and that's a huge bummer. <laughs> that is a huge bummer, but then it's like, you know what, I'm just going to try harder. And maybe you'll harder. be on that wall. Yeah. I love my face on that wall. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then awesome. the next person who has a background like yours can see you there. Yes. Or see you in this video and realize exactly. they can do it too. Yes. Yeah. So, and it, so that was that's probably one of like the earliest things I did notice about that department. It was probably that. But the department is making cha uh, is making a lot of um, strides to to include diversity in the that's department, good. which is awesome. Yeah. So um, same thing with Penn State. They have I think they recently just published their diversity statement. So um, just to let people know that. They welcome people of all backgrounds, and they're working towards being more diverse. Um, but I, I remember looking at their department and their faculty list, and I'm like, well, this is actually a very diverse department. There's lots of women, lots of women with different backgrounds, lots, well, not just women, but people of different backgrounds. Sure, That's yeah. <laughs> also women with different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see like diversity um, in, in that department as well. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah and it, it matters so much to whether or not we feel like we belong in a space. Yeah, and in all honesty, my mentor at uh, my master's program, the one who, who inspired me to get my PhD. Mm -hmm. She is also Asian American as well. And mm. I really connected with her, not because she was also Asian American. I know like there's a stereotype about that. <laughs> um, but it wasn't just that, but seeing someone who was so successful like her, um, doing her job, I was like, wow, she's really inspiring. And I think that's just her personality that really, that I really saw. But it was also like seeing someone that looked kind of like me being, being her. It was like, it's amazing. I would love I would love to be her one day. That sounds really <laughs> single white female. I did not mean to do that. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think it does at all. I, yeah, yeah it's, she inspired me in so many ways, and so it was really nice to find someone that that looks like you too, to to pursue something further. And so, um, out of my family, I'm the first person to get my PhD. Out of all oh, my extended family. That's exciting too. Yes. 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 And so, being a first gen. Um, college student. So my sister was, I think, the first one to go to college in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then it was me. And so being a first gen, but both of us being first gen and my brother, yeah. my younger brother. <laughs> so all of us being first gen um, college students. Um, and even, I think I was, I don't know, my brother's going to get a grad degree, but Ooh. I guess being like the only grad student in the family, it was really hard to kind of translate that for my family because they're like, why can't you come home during Thanksgiving? I'm oh. like, I have to work. <laughs> that's a lie. I actually went home for Thanksgiving every Thanksgiving. I mean, yeah. yeah. But they're like, why don't you come home more in the summer? I'm like, mom, that's field season. Right? Uh, we're busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I actually can't go with Thanksgiving this year now that I realize it because I'm in Pennsylvania and I'm mm. originally from Texas. So That's a kind of a far trip. It's a far yeah. trip mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's really expensive and I don't like traveling just to like spend only a few days with them. But, I yeah. like to spend like a lot of days with them. Mm -hmm. with them so. But anyway, yeah, being first gen, it was pretty difficult because I, I met some people and like, 
I think like almost any, everywhere, it was like, oh yeah, I can just like call my parents and be like, hey, can you help me with this problem um, about how to solve, like what is the study design for this? I just go, What? Yes, <laughs> yes. And I think there was like a Twitter post about it too. I'm like, wow, yeah, that's so true. I'm like, how can you, how can you just call your parents? <laughs> But I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I guess they could be collaborators, I guess. Yeah. Right? yeah. But it is interesting to think about how you have to uh, sort of explain why you're spending so long in school. Yeah, to your that family. too. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of relatives saying, So are you still in school? Why are you still in school? <laughs> <laughs> and I explained to them, like, it's, gra it's graduate school. I, I promise I have at least one degree already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but I, I will say, my my dad my dad and my mom are very proud of me for oh, pursuing awesome. like this degree and Aww. so also with my grandpa he was like you know I want him I want to stay alive long enough to see her get her degree <laughs> so he's Aww. still alive I just want to that's good I just that's clarify. good <laughs> he's still alive um, but yeah it was nice to get that finally get that PhD like in my hand and mm -hmm. just show up and be like hey I, I did it I did it that's Look so sweet I, I love know. it Aww. he's like. Yeah, I think a lot of my family members have tried, and they just were like, no, this isn't for me, so, yeah. And that's so, okay, too. Yeah, so being first gen, it's really interesting, the family dynamics, um, and just, yeah, just being first gen. <laughs> but a lot of, I do know a lot of first gen um, students, just like me, who um, didn't have a family member to rely on to ask for questions. And mm -hmm. I don't think many students actually do that, either. I think. Everyone learns to do things on their own. And some of them are in completely different fields. So <laughs> that too, yeah. It's like, oh. <laughs> so, but yeah. So that's kind of, I guess, my foray into diversity, I guess. Being oh, first good. gen, being Asian American, and having a mentor who helped guide me through life. Yeah. <laughs> who well, I I'm, still talk to to this day. I'm glad you had people that inspired you and helped you get to where you are. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's, it's nice to have a support system. To have someone actually believe in me, like, to say get a PhD, mm -hmm. say those words to me. I'm like, <sighs> my dad would say it, but I'm like, you're my dad. You're supposed to say that. <laughs> you know, you don't count. <laughs> yeah, actually, I tell this to everybody, but he's like the dad that would make me stay inside every day and do math problems. So me and my sister would be crying at our fancy dining table. Not that's not fancy, but it's like the nicer dining table. Sure. We'd just yeah. be crying the whole time because we're like, we just want to play us like oh, two no. times for us. Please let us go out. But I will say my mental math is pretty good. That's valuable. Yeah. That's... So I have him to thank for that. <laughs> he's also still my dad. So yeah. <laughs> I make it sound like he's not Thanks, I'm like, Dad. He's, he's still here. <laughs> yeah. But now he's like, okay, you don't have to do math problems anymore. I'm like, well, yes. I'm not going to anymore. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he's taught me a lot of really good life lessons as well. Nice. So, thanks, Dad. <laughs> and Mom. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, one of the other things I like to ask while we're thinking about diversity is that like uh, a lot of people who might meet us or see us in uh, this capacity, in our professional capacity, are like, oh, well, they're a scientist. But like, we are so much more than our day job, right? Yeah. We are so much more than our I science. Think that. Yeah. So is there something that you think is like really interesting about yourself or like something that might surprise somebody to know that you are a scientist and also? So I don't know if this is actually surprising because I actually find a very high proportion of people who do this. Okay. Uh, but I actually really like knitting and crocheting. Ooh. I'm not the best at it, but like I really find it so soothing. And I love watching videos on YouTube to learn like new stitches. I'm like, oh, I want to try that. And then it doesn't work. I'm like, I don't want to try it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a lot of fun to like make scarves. And it's such a cheap, not, I don't want to say cheap, it's an affordable way to make people presents in quantities. Yes, and so, handmade presents are so nice. They are. They really are. I really need to actually get back into knitting and crocheting. <laughs> um, right now, I've been reading um, mystery, murder mystery books. I love those. Mm -hmm. I'm a mystery murder book enthusiast, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I, haven't read, I haven't read too many, but I actually have a new Ruth Ware book, and I'm mm. looking very forward to reading it. She's a great, really British author. Mm -hmm. And so looking forward to getting into that book after the conference. Nice. Um, you have time for free reading and you're yes. not just reading papers all so, the time. Oh. Yeah, I know. I like, I, so I actually learned about work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, after 5 p.m., I'm like, no. But it's an important email. I will answer it if I ask you. Of course. I will read it and I'm like, I'll like, uh, what is it called? I'll triage it and then I'll like decide if I need to answer it. Nice. But, but anyway, so another thing I actually really recently got into is plant care. So it's, it's oh. almost kind of natural for entomologists and botanists to kind of like merge together. And I think that's kind of happening with me right now because I love watching plant care videos on YouTube. Oh. So PlantTube is a thing. Yeah. I love yeah. it. I love houseplants. I have a houseplant room. 
oh, right now wow. and I actually have to tell my husband like hey you need to make sure the humidifier is on mm -hmm. make sure the grow lights are on don't touch anything else. You don't want to come back from the conference and see all your babies dead. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I spent money on them for yeah. one. Do not water them because you will overwater them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't let the cats in. They will eat them and they mm -hmm. have. I'm surprised they're not dead yet because they've definitely eaten some uh, poisonous ones before. Ooh. So I'm like, nothing bad has happened. They're doing fine. Okay. They're kind of uh, machines. So. Nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah, I've gone to houseplants and I actually have an infestation of fungus nuts. So trying to figure out like IPM about oh. fungus nuts has been a lot of fun as well. Interesting. Because <laughs> even though they're not vectors of anything, I do enjoy learning about like IPM of really like pests in general. Mm -hmm. So not just integrated vector management, but integrated pest management and trying to inter like avoid using um, chemical uh, mm -hmm. pesticides. And just using like you know sticky traps or learning about the life cycle. Yeah. Learning about the life cycle of a lot of insects or arthropods in general can really get you very far. In Absolutely. Them. Yeah. So it's very important to look that up. Yeah. You are the first person I've ever heard say that it was fun to try to figure out how to get rid of fungus gnats, but I love it. It's oh my gosh, they're so they're very they're actually very annoying. I should probably like not say it's fun, but they are very annoying to deal with because they just never seem to go away. Yeah. They never go away, and even when you think they're gone it's like one just flies by you and you're like oh. mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I've been trying everything I've been trying to not water from the top I mean, you got a bottom water like capillary action do mm -hmm. its thing and just hope for the best keep things pretty dry for like the first couple of inches of their soil so it's been a lot of fun just trying out these different things um, but the sticky traps that's probably the most satisfying thing seeing all the fungus that's just mm -hmm. on there it's mm -hmm. really gross as well so awesome yeah so it's it's really nice to combine my interest in entomology to my hobby, my yeah. newer hobby as well. Yeah. So it's so much fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else you would like people to know about you or your science or, mm. you know, anything we didn't cover? I'm, I'm actually not sure. Um, well, I have two cats and a dog. And so uh, my husband actually just recently moved up to Pennsylvania. Okay. And so, um, in Pennsylvania, there are a lot of ticks, a lot yes. of Lyme disease cases. Very. When you actually look at the map of like Lyme disease cases, Pennsylvania is just all blue, all blue. Yeah. Can't even see the state lines. No. I'm like, where is it? It's it's awful. It's awful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So go go Pennsylvania. Yeah. You did it. Yeah. Um, so now that the dog is here, I get very worried about her, and so I'm like, you gotta you gotta make sure she has her anti-flea and tick medication mm. on her. So be, yeah, just I just love applying, like principles of entomology to life because it's so relevant. I didn't realize how relevant it was and when I taught veterinary entomology lab when I was a grad student, um, they, that's probably the most exciting part is when students would come up and tell me like, hey, I learned this in your lab and yeah. now I get to apply it and at home and I get to impress my friends. I'm like, ah, that's that's a cockroach, that's Plutonia. Or, that's Dysonera, that's your silverfish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's probably one of the more exciting things and I love teaching. That's probably one of the other things I probably wanted That's to say about myself. Awesome. I love teaching. It's Yay. great. Um, you get to learn. I get to teach, but I also get to learn a lot as well. Oh, yeah. During that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you have students who are just way smarter than you're like, well, I just got showed up by the student again. <laughs> it's great. So, yeah. So teaching is a lot of fun for me. It's one of my one of my bigger passions as well. So Aww, I think I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. <laughs> yes, it's great. It's great. I Research love is great. Love yeah, because you have to have people to inspire others to do what you want to do as well. You need the new, the newest, the newer generation of people, of scientists, to continue on the work and um, to continue with new innovation, innovations every day. Because there's, there has to be something that there has to be a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. So people need to always find that problem and always innovate and keep going. Absolutely. So. Well, I want to thank Karen so much for talking to us yeah. so late in the evening. But I know. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun talking with you as well. And learning oh. that you were from Penn State has been a lot of fun, too. Because you <laughs> understood, like, oh, yeah, Pennsylvania. Oh, it's the worst. Oof. I got yeah. my first tick the day of senior prom. So That is... Yep. Wow. That's a story. Do you know um, how you got it? Yeah, I was in the woods in a highly barbary infested forest, which explains a lot. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh -huh. That explains a lot. So that's, yeah, that's a taste of PA. Um, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but in any case, um, if you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. Then you can go check out my Patreon page. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you really like science and nerdy goodness, you should also check out my science-themed Dungeons & Dragons show, Nature Check, on Twitch, YouTube, and everywhere you find podcasts. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!